It's 60 degrees. Hello and welcome again to Counterpoint. I'm Mike Hickson. I thank you so much for being a part of our program today. With me, as you well know, B.J. Clark. And B.J. is a great gospel preacher. He directs the Memphis School of Preaching. We appreciate him so very much. And we hope you're going to stay tuned today because we're going to be asking a question today that many people have asked in days gone by. It might be the case that you have this same question. And here it is. Do you have to be a member of the Church of Christ to go to heaven? Please stay tuned. BJ, today as we begin our study, there are many people that have asked this question, and I think it's a fair question. I think it's a question that we should not shy away from, but rather we ought to be able to discuss biblical subjects, and ultimately, if we're going to ask a Bible question, we need to go to the source, don't we? That's right. So Music recognition. when we lay the framework for and hold to show more our study today, do you have to be a member of the Church of Christ to go to heaven? I know that in the minds of some, they would say, well, that's an inflammatory statement. But it is a fair question. And so if someone were to ask you, let's just say you're mm-hmm. discussing the Bible, and they say, well, what about that? Where would you begin, and what would you say? That's a good question. Usually, what I would first say is, what do you mean by Church of Christ? Because some people in this world, when they hear the term Church of Christ, are thinking of the name of a denomination among many other denominations that they've heard. And yet, if you can get someone to see that the Church of Christ that we're talking about is the same one Jesus bought with his blood, Mm -hmm. Acts 20 and verse 28, the same one that was established in Acts chapter 2. Now, it's unquestionable that people were being added to a church, to the church, as of Acts 2.47. Very true. Which raises the question, to which church were they being added? None of the current denominations were in existence. Historically, that that is a fact. And there's no question, someone's church came into existence. Well, who owned it? Well, Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. So he's the Christ. If it's his church, then it's the church of or the church belonging to Christ. So the people on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 who were added to the church were added to the church that belonged to someone. To whom did it belong? It belonged to Christ. Therefore, it was the church of Christ. That's what we mean by the terminology. We're not talking about a denomination among denominations. In fact, as I probably mentioned before on the program over the years that we've done this, I studied with a couple years ago, and we were in the book of Acts chapter 2, and I was noting the very thing I just mentioned to you with them, and then I started to go to another text. And the young lady said, wait, wait, wait. She said, go back, go back. If I understood you correctly just now, you're not trying to get me and my husband to leave our denomination we've grown up in, to Mm -hmm. join your Church of Christ denomination you've grown up in. If I'm hearing you right, you're asking us to become members of the same Church of Christ these people in Acts 2 became members of? That's the Church of Christ that you're trying to get us members of? And I said, I could not have said it better. That's exactly, that's the only church I want to be a part of. And when she realized I wasn't saying, hey, of all the denominations that exist, the number one denomination Mm -hmm. is the Church of Christ. As soon as she understood I was talking about the actual Church of Christ, the one that we read about in Acts 2, she said, shall we go to the pond? They had a pond on their property, and they were ready to be baptized right then. I did baptize them that night at the church building down the road, and I asked them, if someone asked you tomorrow, what would you do last night, what would you say? They said, well, we we would tell them we were saved. And I said, what would you say if they said, oh, great, which denomination? She said, we'd tell them we found out last night we could be saved without joining any denomination. Mm -hmm. We're just members of the Lord's church. That's it right there. And you know what, B.J., that is a beautiful description of what a person does to become a member of the church you just described in Scripture. Now, B.J., you were talking about Matthew 16 a moment ago, 
And in that context, Jesus had raised the question about his identity, and Peter affirmed him to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. In verse 18, as you well noted, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. Now, I know that there are many people in the world today who have the idea that the Lord built the church Mm -hmm. that he promised to build. He built it upon the apostle Peter. Mm -hmm. And so in order for us to clarify, because we're talking about the one true church, number one, did Jesus build the church on Peter? You know, he said to Peter, he said, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. In the original language, there's a difference between the gender for the name Peter and the gender for uh, the church and the rock mm-hmm. that's being built. And so the bedrock upon which the church is built is not the Apostle Peter. The bedrock upon which the church is built is what Peter confessed. That's right. And that is that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's rock solid, and the church is built on that foundation and he's the builder of the church, Jesus Christ is. And Peter would be the first one to, to point that out to us and to say that we ought to be members of the church that belongs to the builder of it. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, if, if the church was built upon the foundation of Peter, and as you noted a moment ago, it wasn't, then Paul's wrong in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 because he said, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. So Jesus not only founded the church, he is the foundation of the church. Now, when we talk about the church of Christ, maybe it would be helpful. I know that there are folks in the world today that they have been taught the church is an afterthought in God's mind. So how would you counter and dispel this idea that the church was an afterthought in the mind of God? You know, when you read uh, Ephesians chapter 3, you can counter that uh, emphatically because it comes right out and says that the church was, notice, according to his eternal purpose. It says there in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse a 10, the church is the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose, which you purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the church wasn't, uh uh-oh, Jesus got rejected. What are we going to do now? Plan B, the church. No, that's not true. God always knew, even before he said, let there be light, Mm -hmm. he had always said, already said, let there be a church. There would be a church. It would belong to Christ that was eternally purposed. Revelation thirteen eight says that he was slain from the foundation mm-hmm. of the world. And why does that matter? Because his blood that was shed when he was slain is what purchased the, the church. church, Acts 20 and verse 28. And to say the church is unessential, I mean, think about it. That's saying the blood of Christ is unessential because the blood purchased the church. It's very essential. So when we talk about do you have to be a member of the church of Christ, to go to heaven. Christ built the church, purchased it with his blood, the saved are in the church, and so the logical conclusion would be, well, of course. Of course you have to be. Now, BJ, there are some who have the idea that the church was a part of God's divine plan of redemption, but really, wouldn't it be more accurate to say the church was and is God's redemptive plan, just as much as Christ was and is God's redemptive plan. I would say absolutely yes to that. And I would say that one of the reasons why people recoil a little bit at the statement that one must be a member of the church of Christ in order to be saved is because they're not emotionally prepared to to accept the idea that God would ever confine salvation to one location, and yet we would like to let the Bible teach us things written aforetime were written for our learning. So let's ask this question. If people in Noah's day had come up to Noah and said, are you saying that this ark that you're building is the only place where men can be saved from the flood that is coming? Are you saying that only you and your little group that get on board that ark 
Are you saying you're the only ones who are going to be saved? Mike, let me ask you, if Noah had been asked that question, what would the correct answer have been? Well, the answer would have been yes, only that small group. As a matter of fact, you were talking about Peter a minute ago. Peter would affirm that because Peter said we're in few. That is, eight souls were saved by water. And so, you know, is that narrow? Yes. Is is that the minority? Absolutely. Well, is it biblical? It is. And it's not arrogant because arrogance would have been for Noah to say, hmm, God only revealed that one location But I think that's too narrow, so I'm going to broaden God's way and say that if you'll just say a prayer, God will lift you up above the floodwaters until they subside, and you don't have to get on board the ark. Look, the truth is that the honest answer Noah could have given, should have given, as you just noted, was, look, all I can tell you is what God told me, and the only thing God has revealed is this boat is the place. It's built large enough for more than eight souls. And so it's your choice. Will you get in the one place that God is going to save you, or will you not? It's your choice. But I didn't come up with this. God did. I'm only telling you what God said. How many places were there? Was one house as good as another when the flood came? No, because a house that was not, in if you weren't housed inside of Noah's Ark. You weren't saved. You were going to be lost. So there was, how many locations were there for salvation from the flood? Only one. So is God ever confined salvation to just one place? Absolutely. Yes. Well, and you know what, BJ? Go back and look at, Gen- in Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Well, Because of God's grace, he spared Noah and his family. Mm -hmm. Well, did Noah have to do anything to appropriate the benefits and the blessings of that grace? Well, God said, build an ark. In Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible says, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Right. So you mean to tell me that he had to do something? It's exactly what the Hebrew writer said. Why? Because faith and obedience go hand in hand. Now, application-wise, in 2 Timothy 2, verse 1, Paul said that God's grace is in Christ. In verse 10, he said that salvation is in Christ. Okay, so if God's grace is in Christ, salvation's in Christ, then I think the logical question, well, then how do we get into Christ? And Acts 4.12 would contribute this thought. There's no other location. No. In no other name. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So how many locations for salvation are there in the New Testament age? In Christ, as you noted, is the only location for salvation. If someone asked me, as a certain man was asked on a national televised program, uh, what about to someone who doesn't believe Jesus is the Christ? Can they be saved? I'm going to give the same answer Jesus himself gave. I am the way, the truth, the life, no man. And let me let me just hit pause button here for just one second, because I want you to come back to this, because I just watched, I think, the very same program that you watched. Uh-huh. Just the other day, I saw some clips, and this gentleman was asked, do you think that only those who believe in Jesus or follow, will enjoy salvation? And the guy quibbled. And look. All I know is what the Bible says. Yes. And as you noted, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. Peter and John, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, neither is there salvation in any. Okay, is that narrow? Yes. Is that pretty? Yes, that's exclusive. So what gives me the right to presume presume something other than what the record says? Jesus himself said in the greatest sermon ever preached, perhaps, in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Narrow is the way that leads unto life, and few there be that find it, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. We've seen, have we ever seen few saved when God wanted to save many? Yes, but that's not God's fault. God made provisions for the salvation of all, but only few will be saved because few are willing to accept his terms. There was one place for salvation for Noah and his family, and you know, think about it. Has God ever confined salvation to one plan? In the days of the plagues, when the 10th plague was ready to hit, Exodus 12, how many different ways were there for 
those individuals to be saved if they were a firstborn Israelite. God said, here's what you do. On the 10th day of this month, you take a lamb unblemished, and you keep it till the 14th day of this month. It needs to be a male lamb. Sounds like God's being very specific. There was one day as good as another to take the lamb. Was one gender as good as another for the lamb? No. Was a blemished lamb uh, good? Was an unblemished lamb? Okay, yes, but not a blemished lamb. So one bl- lamb wasn't as good as another. And then kill it in the evening. One time of day wasn't as good as another to kill it. Smear the blood where? Just anywhere? No. On the two side posts, the upper door post, not one place was as good as another to smear the blood. Sounds very specific, doesn't it, Mike? And yet, God says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. If someone had come to Moses and Aaron and said, whoa, 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 whoa. Are you saying that the only Israelites who are firstborn, who will be spared from this 10th plague, are those who take a male unblemished lamb on the 10th day, keep it till the 14th day, kill it in the evening, observe the Passover. Are you saying those are the only people who are going to be saved from this plague? What would the right answer have been? The right answer would be you listen very attentively <laughs> because yes, yes, yes. There, I, I mean, how could you be saved otherwise? And so, by way of application, all right, are we saying then there is one house right. wherein the blood covers our sins? Yes. Where Where is that one place? It's the church. Well, what church? The church of Christ. The church that belongs to Christ. Mm-hmm. And Acts chapter 2 when we render obedience to the gospel, when we do what they did, and what were they instructed to do? Number one, to repent. Number two, they were told to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ by his authority. For what reason? For the remission, the forgiveness of their sins. Right. When they did that, how then were they classified? Well, they were classified as saved people because the Bible says in verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily those who were saved. You remember in Acts chapter 5, verse 14, when when Luke said, and the believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Right. Now, the word believers there is a generic term, but it means more than just, okay, I believe in my mind right. in Jesus. Mm-hmm. It carries with it the idea of an obedient faith. That's where a lot of folks miss it. Did Noah have an obedient faith, or did he just believe what the Lord said? He had an obedient faith. How do I know that? Thus did Noah according to all, A-L-L, that God commanded him. So if I do not do all that God commands me to do to become a child of God, will I be a child of God? (laughs) You know, Hebrews chapter 11 speaks of the Passover in those very same terms. You know, he talks about, uh, you know, obedient faith all through Hebrews 11. And then there's that statement there in verse number uh, 28, through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So that was by faith. They had to believe that if I'll do this, put the blood where God said put it, on the day God said put it there, at the time God said put it there, with the kind of lamb God said to use, that he would do what only he could do. What if one of these guys had said, you know what, you all go do that if you want, if that's your truth. But my truth is, I'm just going to pray the prayer of the firstborn. I'm going to ask God and say, God, you're so powerful. You don't even need me to smear blood anywhere for you to be able to save my firstborn. God, I'm asking you by virtue of prayer to save my firstborn. If someone had said, I'd rather do that instead of what God said to do, would that have worked? No. And so let me ask this, Mike. If God has given us a plan of salvation in the New Testament, and he has, and you just fleshed it out a moment ago from Acts 2, what makes us think, well, I won't do that. I'll just pray instead. Where do we get that? No, and, and you know what? Maybe, to, maybe, in an, maybe in an effort to connect the dots or you know, cross the T's and mm-hmm. dot the I's, right. Maybe we need to go back, because since you're talking about the firstborn in Hebrews chapter 11, you remember following the Passover, 
In Exodus chapter 13, God said, Sanctify to me all the firstborn, Mm -hmm. whoever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and animal. God said, It is mine. All right, you said a minute ago that Christ purchased the church with his blood, Acts 20, verse 28. And that when we talk about the church of Christ, we're talking specifically about the church that belongs to Christ. It's not my church, wasn't Paul's church, wasn't Peter's, it's the Lord's church. Right. All right, let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 11, or chapter 12, rather. Right. And let's note what the writer there said, and note how he links the firstborn under the, well, going all the way back to Exodus chapter 13 and the giving of the Passover and the church of Christ. In verse 23, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, okay? The church of the firstborn? Under the old, under, under what, under the covenant patriarchal period, mm-hmm. well, not patriarchal, but mosaic dispensation, right? God said, the, the, the firstborn belongs to me. So in Hebrews chapter 12, God's saying that the church belongs to me. Well, who are, who are the church? People. And those who have obeyed the gospel, what are they? They belong to God. They are the church of the firstborn. Right. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul said, you are bought with a price. Yes. You're not your own. Why? Because we belong to God. The church is God's. So do you have to be in the church to go to heaven? Did you have to be in the house where the blood was to go uh, to be spared from the destroying it? Yes. Absolutely. And, you know, I can't help but think of another Old Testament example mentioned in Hebrews 11. It's Rahab and her family. And you think about this. Rahab was told, we're going to be looking, when we come to Jericho, we're going to be looking for the scarlet cord in the same window you let down the spies. So... Was one window as good as another? No. No. Was one color cord as good as another? No, we're looking for the scarlet cord. Was one house in Jericho as good as another? Rahab was told, bring your family to your house. Now, what if her family had said, what makes your house better than ours? As she could have said, look, I'm not saying it's better inherently. I'm saying since that's the God-appointed place for you to come, that's what I'm telling you. You need to come to the house where the scarlet cord's going to be hanging from that window I let the spies down by. And when they did, they were guaranteed to be safe as long as they remained in the house. Right. And so there's a house today. The house of God is the church of the living God, First Timothy 3.15. That's it. <laughs> and therefore, we need to get people in the house where the scarlet blood of Christ has cleansed it and washed it, and that's a safe place. That's right. And you know what? Going back to Judges chapter, or rather Joshua chapter 2, note if you would the connection to faith. In verse 9, when the spies came, she said, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. Down in verse 11, as soon as we heard these things, okay, how's faith come? By hearing, Romans right. ten seventeen. So she heard, she believed, she obeyed, she was saved along with her household. So if we demonstrate that same level of faith, what's going to happen? We're going to be saved. And you know what, DJ? So let's look at Ephesians five twenty three. The Bible says that Christ is the Savior of the body. All right, if the saved are in the body, then we need to define the body, don't we? That's right. So what's the body? He tells us in Ephesians 1, and 23, he's the head of the body, the church. Now, wait a minute. People ask, do I have to be a member of the church of Christ in order to be saved? Well, let's just take this and let Paul's own book in inspired words Answer the question. This is not Mike Hickson. It's not B.J. Clark. It's the Apostle Paul, governed by the Holy Spirit, guided by the Spirit. He says, as you noted, Ephesians 5.23, he's the Savior of something. The body. He's the Savior of what? The body. The body. So if I'm not in the body, I'm not in that which he's going to save. That's it. So must I be in that which he's the Savior of? Yes. What is it? He's the Savior of the body. What is the body? The church. How many are there? Ephesians 4.4, 4. there is one body. 
That sounds narrow, but I didn't write it. No. It's in the Bible. I believe it. There's one body or one church. The man who's not in the body is not in that which Jesus is the Savior of. When I've studied this with people over the years, I'll sometimes take a napkin at the restaurant or scrap piece of paper or put it on my iPad and show it and say, look, here's a man who's not in the body. Jesus is the Savior of the body. Based on these two verses, Ephesians 5.23 and 4.4, does he need to be in the one body Jesus is the Savior of to be saved? And you know what? They say, not hesitating, yes, because when they hear the term body of Christ, that doesn't sound like a denomination they've heard of because it's not. That's right. So then we say, okay, you've just admitted this man has to be a member of the body of Christ. You know what the body is? Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. It's the church. Take the word body, erase it, put the word church there. Now, does this man have to be a member of the church that belongs to Christ? And why would the diagram uh, change, the truth of the diagram change? It hasn't. It has not. Matter of fact, I think maybe by way of complimenting what you said, look at Rome, in Romans chapter 12. Mm-hmm. Listen to what Paul said in verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body where? In Christ. There you go. The one body, the church, is in Christ. Now, there are a lot of folks that are watching the program, and they would acknowledge with us, and rightly so, that there is only one God. Right. And that Jesus is the exclusive way. So that means, are you saying then that if you don't go through Jesus, you can't be saved? That's exactly what we're saying. Okay, the same Bible that teaches there's one God, one Lord, the Bible also says there's one body. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're in the one body, then you can be counted among the saved. But if you're not in the one body, you're not among the saved. So on Pentecost Day, when those people obeyed the gospel of Christ, if we were to have asked them, okay, what church do you now belong to? What would they have said? Yeah. They didn't know about modern-day denominational names. They would have just understood, I'm a member of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, Christ church, the Lord's church, the church of Christ. And they would have meant nothing denominational by that. Not one bit. And so, so do you have to be a member of the church of Christ to go to heaven? And if the answer is yes, what then do you have to do? Mm -hmm. Uh, You remember the jailer, what must I do to be saved? Are there specific things? Well, yes. So what would that entail? You know, what did they do on the day of Pentecost before they were added to the church? They heard the word. They believed that Jesus is the Christ after all. We killed Christ, the Son of God. And they were told, when they said, what shall we do? Peter didn't say, well, you just did it. You believe. That's all you need to do. He said, no. Now you need to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38, about 3,000 did. They were added. And to what were they added? To the only thing that the Lord built that day, the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what they became members of. And people today watching this program can be members of the same church. And you know what? The Hebrew writer said that when you are part of the church of the firstborn, your name is registered yep. in heaven. You have your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And listen, we all want to go to heaven. Volume. Brightness. Volume. Selected. Selected. Screen.